Starting recording. Welcome to HDM Hackers Hangout. It's nine o'clock, September 6th, Friday. We've got one, two, three, four, five people connected right now. Great. So this is first time on Zoom. Thanks for trying it out. Um, I'm, I'm gonna, anybody's free to uh, chime in if they, have a, if they have a comment. I'm gonna go through an agenda and talk about some points and then we'll have you know some conversations on the topics. Um, so, uh, but I am sort of stealing the screen right now to go over the agenda real quick. So, um, right, share. I wanna share, there we go, my, again, bear with me because this is the first time, I think I can just share my whole desktop one, right? Is that working? It's not, hold on, just a moment. Google Chrome, three, no. The whole thing, it's gonna be easier if I do the whole thing. Okay, there we go. So you can, you should be able to see this Hackers Hangout, that's where I'm pointing at. All right, so here's my agenda. We're gonna talk about um, the discussions we've been having recently about hex grids, which has been super interesting, and that's Mark Brown's on, online. If you can't join in, I understand Mark, but uh, We'll certainly continue this conversation on the forums. I'll give an update on 2D object recognition stuff, which I haven't had much time to work on lately. Uh, the elephant's comment was, um, I want to I want to explain, I want to open for conversation this topic about hierarchy a little bit, and we'll just leave it at that. Um, let's see. So the interface is blinking at me. It just says, okay, I'm still figuring this out. So there's just a chat message. I see how it's in, indicated. All right. Um, and then I also want to mention this Brains at Bay meetup we're, that, we're, that we're doing and explain a little bit about it and what I've been doing on Nupic Torch to create a proper open source contribution, pipeline, automation, continuous integration, etc. All right, so that's what um, I'm going to talk about. Hello, everybody. Um, since this is a meeting, uh, maybe we could, go, if, if you want to, say a word about uh, why you're interested or what you're working on or anything. Um, I would be happy for, for all of you to do that if you have a chance. There's some type of um, something in the UI in Zoom that lets you raise your hand. Um, I don't remember where it is, but there's some way to raise your hand. So I'm gonna be looking for that if you guys can figure out how to do it. Uh, I'll watch for any raised hands. If you have something that you wanna say, that's a great way to say it, and then I'll hand it off to someone else, but I don't know. I saw it the other day, I swear. Oh, yeah, there we go. So Martin raised his hand. Hello. <laughs> yeah, just testing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it worked great. Uh, okay, so um, I couldn't find mine, but it's there any, somewhere. Okay, so let's go to hex grids. Uh, is anybody interested in that? So what I'm gonna do here, what I'm gonna do here is, um, so I've gotten a better understanding of this, I think, recently. So I'm going to draw some pictures and pretty much, I'm doing this for you, Mark. Uh, if you can interact or not, either way is great. But I'm going to kind of sort of describe where I, what I see HTM theory and what I see in this hex grids thing and where there's any confusion. And the reason, I haven't been able to talk to Jeffrey much about it. He's on vacation right now, but he has emailed me about it, so he's interested. Um, but I'll go over the, the latest thinking about, about that. Um, and uh, point to Mark's hex grids uh, uh, form thread, which is in the link that I sent. So let, I'm going to do that. I'm going to switch to another video and go to a whiteboard. Haha. <laughs> okay. Assuming you guys can hear me okay over here, I'm going to adjust my mic a little, maybe. All right. Um, so here we have a pyramidal neuron. I'm going to try and just sort of describe this issue. And, and hopefully you're somewhat familiar with HTM theory, but uh, these neurons have axons. And so this is what I got from, this is what I talked about to Jeff about this for a while on Wednesday. A neuron has an axon that comes out, part, uh, it, it, this is uh, Jeff's understanding right now, okay? It bifurcates, it splits in two, and then um, half of it, or one path leads outside of the cortex. It goes out of the cortex. And the other one travels within the cortex going somewhere else. So um, the, uh, the idea that we have about this in HTM is that this goes a really long way, okay? Really long distances. So we're not in, within the same sort of 
area of this neuron, but it will reach another point in time and create these tufts of uh, places where it will connect to dendrites in another area of um, cortex, right? So there might be other neurons in, around in here that have their sort of dendritic arbors and, and it's creating connections to neurons in this area. We, in HTM speak, we'll call this, and this is in, in the code as well, so we have arrays of these, we call this a segment. Okay, this thing is a segment and it has you know, synapses. And then the idea is when you create another segment, the, the, the axon continues to grow and it'll go out some other you know, unknown distance, I don't know. But uh, I would assume, I don't know if I want to assume anything at this point, but um, uh, probably in the same, I don't know, some unknown distance and basically does it again. And so we're modeling this, you know, creates more synapses with other dendrites in this other area. So we're modeling all of this happening. Basically, this is um, temporal memory, you know, where you have distal segments that have synapses. Um, and, the, and we're representing the synapses from the distal point of view. That's the one thing that's confusing about this is if you look at our theory and you read our uh, pseudocode, we're really representing these values from the view of the dendrites, not the axons. So you have to think backwards a little ways, if that makes sense. Okay, so this is HTM theory, right? So let's, for, let's forget this for a while. It, the ax, there's one axon and it grows out. So what Mark is saying, and I'll let, I'll let you forget, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but what Mark is saying and what Calvin is saying and what these other uh, documents that they're say, uh, showing are saying that this goes off in, in many different directions, sort of somewhat omnidirectionally. Not, and not just it goes out of the, of the cortex, but it also stays in the cortex and there's some type of cloud pattern or some type of spherical um, arbor of, uh, of axons, okay? Um, and that means that when these guys create tufts out here, because they're gonna do the same thing, they'll, they'll, they'll synapse a whole bunch, they'll create these tufts, um, and then these are long distances. Again, this is not close. Um, so I wanna you know, put a little thing here on each one of these to show you that these go a long way uh, relative to you know, the neurons, the neuron itself. So these guys are all gonna synapse and, and connect to some group of neurons somewhere else. And these are all sort of different neighborhoods of neurons that's connecting to different parts of cortex. So I got that right. And that's where we can talk about um, hex grids because when you have, because this interplay um, gives you a, a, there's a, there's a, it's so hard to explain this for me because um, I don't quite understand all of it yet, but it's uh, the best way, I, the best vision I have of this in my head is that there's like, there's an unstable grid or many unstable grids that are sort of partially formed constantly. And depending on input from below or activity from in, in, in the connections, different grids emerge in different ways in, in this sort of configuration. So if you want, I, I'm still, uh, one thing that, I do want to show, let me show something different now. Uh, what do I, what, how can I do this? This is what I want to show, let's show this. Okay, so this is a paper um, that really got me thinking and it was linked from, uh, in, in BitKings, in Mark's, in your original post, you linked to a paper that was really complicated and you said this is a complex paper. This was one of the main papers it referenced when it was talking about these axonal projections. So I read through some of this paper. I, I didn't understand all of the methods and, and stuff because I'm not a neuroscientist, but I think I get the gist of it. And um, so the gist of it is, let me look in the chat here. Yeah, okay, so Mark's saying, should be far more branches. The clouds don't like the proximal. Well, so, these, so are you talking about this, these clouds, Mark? Because this, 
this is, I don't feel like this is the same. This is short. Th these are short connections. This is like a little local cloud. These aren't the long, these aren't the long ones. These are, so if you look at this, um, here's the scale. And so this is 200 micrometers here. So we're only talking like from the SOMA, 400 micrometers, 500, 600, you know, 1,000 max. And is, that a, is that a millimeter? One millimeter? Is 1,000 micrometers a millimeter? Yeah. Okay. So aren't we, with, with these longer connections, are, are we talking about longer ranges than, than that? Maybe, or is that what Calvin's saying? These are the, those things. Because this doesn't jive, I don't think, with, uh, if you look at this one, this is a millimeter, right? So, so I, when I look at this uh, graphic, it looks like the, that cloud is in the middle here, and then the connection, the axonal tufts that they're finding are, are in this pattern around it, because this is like two millimeters away. That's what I, that's what I thought. So it's not just this, this cloud, there's two things here. There's this cloud, and then there's these, like this is what A is pointing to here, right, right here. And it says, uh, 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 something about the arrow. Yeah, note the labeled fibers arrow continue to spread horizontally beyond this terminal field. Um, so, so they're identifying these fibers all this far out. Is that what they're trying to say? It covers sub, several cell types. Okay. Are, are you, you guys are seeing my, the, I can't tell if I'm showing my, I think I'm showing my screen. I hope. <laughs> um, okay. Anyway, um, I'm going to, Jeff and I are going to talk about this when he gets back because I think this is an interesting paper. The, okay. So there's one thing. Um, let me just tell you. Okay. I'm going to stop. So I'm going to turn my camera back on me. Okay, before we go on to another topic, this was just, I'm, I'm happy to hear if you have anything to say, Mark, if you can, but otherwise, you know, we'll continue discussion on, on the forum because I think this is something I'm going to look into. Um, see the length histograms in the paper. Okay, so I'll look through. I still have more to read in this paper. So let me go back to what Jeff said. Uh, like I said, I've been talking to him about this. Um, so the, so <clears throat> he was saying, <clears throat> excuse me, the way he understands it, which was the segment and then sent and a tuft and the segment and a tuft, and there's only one of those, he said his comments were from V1. So that's the way he understands it to happen in V1. Um, and, and also he doesn't, he never saw that those longer distance connections are omnidirectional but he said that there are short range connections that are omnidirectional. So he, but, I, but he didn't give any measurements to those. And then in the last thing that he said, um, he emphasized again, because I pointed him to this paper and I, and I said that it looks like, because if you look at some of those graphics, I gotta show you again. Look at some of these graphics I forgot to show. <laughs> um, where's the good ones? These, these are the ones I posted on the forum. This is pretty explicit about what they're trying to show is going on here. Um, this graphic, and then there was another one down here. This one, these are the ones I put on the forum. This is the one I showed Jeff too. Um, and this, this is showing axonal projections in two, three, and four, and, or sorry, in five, and in six. And this is all prefrontal cortex. All right. So that's interesting. Uh, so uh, see the link, uh, there's a preferred length. Okay, so I'll check it out, I'll check it out. Uh, so that was, that's where we're at with, with hex grids. I think this is interesting. I'm interested to see what, uh, what Jeff comes up with. Jeff has always said, since I've been working there, that if someone can invalidate anything about uh, the theory we create, that's a great thing. That's a, because it, it opens up a bunch of doors. Uh, because uh, you realize you're doing something wrong and, and you have to look at alternatives. Because um, usually that disproof comes with an alternative or a reason for it that you can investigate. Um, so, um, 
I, mean, I would be happy if this if uh, we found out that something like this was happening because then we could ex we could continue to expand the theory and um, oh, it's exciting. Okay, so we should get back to the agenda, right? <laughs> okay, thanks for sticking in there, you guys. Uh, so the, the next thing was this 2D object recognition pro uh, project. I will. Uh, um, I don't actually have anything to say about this. I, I linked to it. I'm. There's a PR. I, I should. I'll say something. There's a PR that I um, can't pronounce the guy's name. <laughs> there's a PR on it. So here, here's the project. Zbysek. Uh, Zbysk. Um, so he has a PR, and um, it contains. Is this it? I don't know where the uh, the link is, but there's a pull request here. He added HTM core to this, which is which is awesome. And he did exactly what I asked somebody to do. I said, <laughs> someone should try and hook up an HTM to this, basically. And he did it. So I was super happy that he did that. And then now he has a, and I merged that PR, adding HTM core. And now he has another PR or another branch that um, adds um, uh, actually does some of the comp the layer constructions, you know, and, and ties them together, which is again something I was asking people to do. So I need to take some time to look into this, and I'm and I'm going to I'm planning on it, but um, I'm hopefully I I'm trying to free up some of my own time in the next week to do this because uh, I've got a lot of demands right now. Uh, but I think I can free up some time this week to do it. Uh, okay, so that was that issue. Um, uh, the elephants thing. So this, this wasn't uh, my idea. Uh, so this came from a forum topic about the hierarchies. The, the, it was called, are there two hierarchies or something like that? And um, it, took a, it took a really long time for this to sink in for me. If you're thinking about vision, the, the idea that all of the columns are doing object recognition, that it's not feature detection or feature extraction at the lower levels and then combinations of those features at the mid levels and then combinations of combinations at the higher levels. But that's not what the hierarchy's doing as far as object composition and construction. The, each one of the many columns, or not many columns, each one of the cortical columns, wherever it's at in, in the hierarchies, is doing the same thing. It's doing object recognition in the same way. Um, so, uh, so you can't think of them as different parts of a, of a process or of a, of a construction or something. You have to think of it as doing exact, like the, the composition happens in the unit. It has to happen in the unit and it has to be completely like agnostic about whether it's getting parts and pieces or direct sensory input, you know, at wherever it's at in the unit. So that's challenging. Um, anyway, <laughs> um, one of the, 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 the things that Jeff told me, and this is again a story from Jeff, about how to think about the hierarchy in this way or the lack of hierarchy in this way where you're doing object recognition is to imagine, he, he used the, just a, a letter, like an A, but I like the putting more something more tangible to it, uh, uh, the elephant, and looking through a straw, that's like what V1 sees, um, that's the field of view that it sees, it's, a, it's about like looking through a straw, so it has a very high detailed viewpoint of a small field of view in your vision, that's what V1 gets. If you go up the hierarchy, the field of view gets broader, and um, the amount of detail gets, Lower, um, and that goes that. That's true as you go up the hierarchies, also in like somatic sensory areas, and I assume auditory sensory areas. But the higher levels get direct sensory input. That's one of the things that the old sort of classic hierarchy could not explain. Why do the higher levels get direct sensory input if there's this you know compositional thing going on at each level in the hierarchy? Um, so, um, what was I saying? Oh yeah, so. Uh, so the, the analogy of looking at through a straw at an elephant on the horizon and realizing that there's one cortical column that has that, I mean, <clears throat> there's a lot of them that have overlapping views probably about space, <clears throat> but one cortical column has a field of view of about <clears throat> looking through a straw like that. So it ha And you can recognize an elephant when you look through a straw at it. You can recognize thousands of things. You, you know, it just has to be far enough away <clears throat> that and the scale down small enough um, that you can see most of the object and put it together. 
So uh, if you go, if you're thinking about higher up in the hierarchy, and, and this was the idea was thinking the elephant at a distance and the elephant very close away, or very close to you. Um, at a distance, your higher levels of the hierarchy would not be able to recognize an elephant because it doesn't have enough detail to see the appendages on it. Um, it just gets sort of a gray blur. So it's not going to help when object, uh, identifying an object at a distance, the higher levels, because the, the, they don't have the resolution. So only the lower levels are going to be able to do object recognition at that, at that level. And you can. You can do it. You can look very far away, and you can identify something very particular um, without any input except V1. You know, you test it out yourself. Just look through a straw at all the things around you. And it takes scanning a while, but, you know, I can tell that's a leaf on a plant, you know. Um, anyway, uh, I thought that was an enlightening way to think about it. And, and in one of the uh, forum conversations, someone said, I can't remember who, someone said it's almost like, a, I think it might have been Casey. Um, like, there, you can think of the different regions of the hierarchy as being different senses. <clears throat> and and I, I think that's an interesting way to think of it. The hierarchy seems to be less and less important um, the, more, the more we look into it, it feels like, to me. There's very, very few connections that are hierarchical. Most of them are lateral anyway. Um, but all of them work together. And it's more about break, how they break out uh, the, the, the sensory field of view, perhaps, than it is about how a lower level informs a higher level. I think they all inform each other. Each, each layer, uh, Paul's very clear that HTM must include pooling in time and space. Absolutely, it has to. Uh, and yeah, and that's that's what, and we can, I think we can pool over, is it, when does it seem like it would be more useful to be able to pool um, sort of over a broad combination of, of different scales and details, you know, than it is just to do them at different hierarchical levels, so. Um, each layer adds some sort of feature extraction, time or space, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, so that was about the elephants. Um, open, open to comments and suggestions of, about this. If anybody wants to add any, thanks, Mark, for your chat. Um, if you guys don't see it, Mark's chatting over here. You, you can open up a chat somehow on Zoom. <laughs> I'm not sure if the chat is included in the video recording. Probably not. Did, I mean, Mark might have mentioned that. All right, the next topic we're going to go to, I don't see any hands raised, so the next topic we're going to go to is uh, the Brains at Bay Meetup. Um, so this, I, I've been recording these, I don't think I'll show it to you. The link is in on the forum, um, but it, we've had two meetings. The first meeting had like 10 people, the second one had like 35. <laughs> so it grew fast, which is great, but we ran out of space at the Mints at HQ. So um, I'm looking for alternative venues in the Silicon Valley area, preferably close to Caltrain Station, um, if anybody wants to help out with that. Um, let me know, matt at nementa.org, you can email me. Um, so it's gone well. The first one, the topic was continuous learning. And so the idea is um, it's, a lot, it's a lot of paper review. So usually there's a, there's a few papers that are being investigated, and then someone deep dives, reads the paper, and this, these are like machine learning papers for the most part, um, because um, this we're sort of targeting the machine learning audience and saying, how can we apply brain-inspired ideas to machine learning, you know, the thing that we've been saying at Nementa. So since we're sort of hosting it, and our, one of our employees is, is running the thing, we always uh, present one of our ideas, but we let anybody else come in and present uh, one, a paper that's related, like how to add sparsity, how to do pruning, that sort of thing. Um, and it's, there's free pizza. <laughs> um, so that's still happening, but we're trying to find another venue. The second one, the one that had so many people was about sparsity. So there's a lot of interesting stuff there. And then we had brain neuromorphics there to talk about their, their new chip. I don't know that there is a name for it, but it's a uh, very well suited for sparse matrix operations and very well suited for neural, um, emulation and HTM. It's, very, very interesting show. And the next meeting, I don't know what it's going to be about, but <clears throat> we're, we're trying to find a venue. I think, I think there's a plan. I just don't remember what it is. Um, 
All right, uh, I have one last topic and I guess we'll just open it up for discussion. So let's move, let me, let me share my screen one more time. I'm gonna tell you guys what I'm working on with Nuvic Torch. Uh, so if you don't know, Nuvic Torch is, I right, see this, Nuvic Torch is our Python Torch implementation of um, uh, a biologically inspired, essentially what we've learned in HTM, biologically inspired um, applications to deep networks in Torch. So we're gonna, we do this, we're doing this in Torch now, excuse me. Um, we're gonna also put one together in TensorFlow. So what I am doing is, um, in, just in good faith, being a good open source community manager, um, I've got a uh, PR and I'm putting together the proper contributing documents so uh, people know um, how they should contribute. So we're no longer really maintaining Nupic anymore. So this is gonna be pretty much our, at this point, our main open source offering is currently Nupic Torch and what will be Nupic TensorFlow. So I'm sort of giving it the nice open source treatment and make sure um, we've got a, a pipeline uh, for deployment and for pull request validation and all that stuff. Uh, honestly, Lewis has done a lot of this work for me already and he continues to do a lot of my work um, in this area because he's simply better at it. So uh, thanks Lewis if you're watching. Um, anyway, uh, keep an eye on this Nupic Torch. Um, I'm gonna, we're gonna be working on, on visuals and such and this is a library that I'm gonna be using heavily, we'll be using heavily uh, over, the, over the next few months to um, put together some interesting visuals about how sparsity applied to neural networks and, and other ideas that we're investigating um, can improve their performance in different ways. All right, so that's the last bit. That's the last thing that I am I'm working on and the last topic that I had. And so I'm gonna open up the conversation to anybody else who wants to join him. I always have to wait a while, so I'll be patient. Someone's on the verge. I know it. Okay, well, if you're watching this on YouTube, please take a moment to like the video and subscribe to our channel. We do these Hackers Hangouts pretty much once a month. Sometimes I miss them. Um, we're, we're trying out Zoom this time, but it will end up on YouTube at some point, no matter what um, live streaming system I use. So uh, with that, I think that's pretty much the state of the HTML hacker space right now. Um, thanks, Matt, no microphone today. So just lurking, Zoom worked well, great. Gene says thanks, okay. Thanks everybody for joining, I appreciate it. Have a wonderful weekend. See you next time. I have to press this button.